Welcome to Night Light. Step away from the mainstream and gather around as we enlighten the world and our realities and travel this cosmic journey we call life. Join us as we share with you and provide that beacon that can guide us all to a better way. Explore with us as we examine a metaphysical montage of spiritual insights covering everything from the mundane to the magical, UFOs to unicorns, and everything in between. This is a time of awakening, of sharing and evolving, of spreading our wings and soaring on the cosmic breath of creation. Come and join with other light-minded spirits as we weave our lights together to seek understanding, enlightenment, and with a little luck, some wisdom. This is Night Light, a reminder that you are never alone. Welcome to another exciting episode of Nightlight. We hope everyone who is in the path of Hurricane Ida will be okay. Uh, tonight's show marks three years of me being with Barbara, and the fourth year looks like it's going to bring many new guests and captivating topics. Um, and if I cause Barbara trauma over the last three years, uh, maybe tonight's show will help to heal her. Um, and tonight is the promised follow-up to last week's Mothman Legacy show, but you know, we're not going to get into Mothman tonight, but you know, just going to be looking at trauma. Um, Reverend Michael J.S. Carter has been a frequent guest on Nightlight for what, maybe about seven years or so he's made his frequent appearances. Uh, he is the author of Alien Scriptures, A New World If You Can Take It, God Consciousness, The Metaphysics of Spiritual Healing, and his latest publication is Initiation. It's a handbook to help other experiencers. Perhaps you'll even see Michael soon on another episode of Ancient Aliens. And if that is not enough, we have the lovely, super smart, and multi-talented Ramona Scott. She hosts the always thought-provoking Ramona Speaks the Other Truth on Saturday nights from 7 to 9 p.m. Eastern Time on the Global Enlightenment Radio Network. So uh, be sure to check out her shows as well. Hi, Ramona and Michael. How are you tonight? I'm feeling pretty good. I'm glad to be on the show and uh, to work with you again. And it's good to, it's good to hear from you, Ramona. I'm excited. I'm really excited. I can't wait. Yeah, uh, I think this is going to be a unique uh, two-hour exploration of all kinds of top. Uh, yeah, it's just it's going to be good stuff. Um, so you know, just kick back and enjoy our discussion for the next two hours. Um, yeah, Michael, I truly enjoyed your new book, Initiation. It's what combination of part autobiography, some profiling, biographies of other experiencers. Uh, you know, the reader is going to get a little bit of everything in their UFOs and healing, spirituality, uh, you take your readers on a ride 
you know, it's what, 120 page book. It's not, it's not a super long book. It's it, easy read, but it's thought provoking. Um, maybe we should just, you know, since we do a lot of book reviews, you know, let's just start with the basics of doing a book review. Uh, first thing that really captures a reader's attention is the cover artwork. Um, that needs some explanation. Can, can, can you tell us a little bit about the artist and what she is conveying with the uh, painting she did? Well, yeah. Uh, Karen Ellsworth, uh, who was a resident of New Zealand, um, she does what she calls extra-dimensional art. I, I met her on Facebook some years ago, and uh, what she does, she's a very talented mm -hmm. psychic, and um, what she does is she gives you a reading of the guides that are talking to you or talking to her to get to you, and then she jo and then she paints them. I have a wonderful painting that she gave me of one of my guides. Her book cover, um, it wasn't my first choice. The first choice was an artist. Uh, I just, it'll, she'll remain nameless now, but um, uh, who does a lot of UFO artwork. But, the, you know, it was, it was a, a scene of a woman in bed and a, a saucer. It was, it was a drawing. It was painted. A saucer outside of her window. Her windows were open. And there was a being walking in to her bedroom. And uh, uh, the editor, my editor, said, Michael, it's a wonderful um, illustration, but it's too scary. It will... It, it will bring up, it will trigger things, which I thought about it, and she was right. Um, but that's what it was. It was a woman lying in bed on her back, windows, uh, you could see the windows were blown open by the wind, and there's a, sh a ship outside shining a light into her bedroom, and there was a gray person walking into her room. And so um, as much as I liked that, I thought that my editor uh, had some keen insight. So I looked for some other artists, and I found Karen. Now, what Karen is conveying, and also what my editor, uh, you know, was, 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 was saying as well, is that the colors are very calming. They're soothing. Mm -hmm. uh, I like blue is my favorite color, blue and silver. And this individual meditating uh, and, you know, the symbols and uh, the you know the artwork around her symbolizes the multi-dimensionality of what we can go through as experiencers in meditation, and of course with the experience itself. And so I thought, wow, this is really, really lovely. It's calming. It's soothing. And uh, you know, as you know, the cover of a book is what catches people's eyes and makes them want to look at it and pick it up. So I thought this was perfect, and then we decided to get bookmarkers uh, with the same illustration. So that's the story of that. Okay. And I, 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 the colors really do make a difference. The light purple, you know, silver, diamond uh, type, yeah, with the teal in it, 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 it yep. and you see her chakras, and uh, yep. and um, it really does, you know, suggest a multi-dimensional experience. Well, it, it, and if you know, get, getting in alignment foreshadows your contents of the book. So, yeah, but yeah, and, but uh, um, I was thinking as we are, you know, just get un underway. Um, maybe read a quote from towards the second half of the book and maybe start there. Um, 
you know, you write, I acknowledge that none of this makes sense to the Western scientific worldview. Um, it, you, know, you do ask us to bring a more open mind to this reading experience. But, um, can you tell us a little a little bit more about, you know, what you meant by that line with the uh, uh, Western scientific mind? Well, I, I think because of the high strangeness of what happens during the contact experience, and of course I'm not saying anything new. I mean, John Mack uh, was talking about this when he was alive, and uh, he was a scientist. Um, that, you know, this whole Cartesian kind of worldview, of, you know, that if you can't see, taste, touch, hear, or smell it, that it doesn't exist. I think that what's happening uh, now, what's been happening for quite some time, is that the experiencer and, and other folks who are into quantum physics and that kind of thing, they're getting it that there's much more to reality that than what we really know and that sometimes the questions are more important than the answers and so what what this phenomenon forces us to do those of us who choose to is to say is the question what is real what is real uh and so whether that whether that's how the visitors can seem to bend and travel through time and space, how they can walk through your wall and walk through solid objects, whether they can do auto-suggestion and, and, and have you go to a place where, you know, maybe a physical or geographical place where you have no idea even while you're there until after something happens. And then as Kierkegaard said, life is lived forward but understood backwards. And so it makes us, uh, most of probably, most of, I believe, of what we were taught about what is real is, is falls short. Absolutely. And I think we're coming into a time now where, please jump in, Ramona, where, um, where we have to start questioning uh, what, you know, are we the only, are we the highest people on the food chain? Probably not. Are there life on other planets? Probably. Are there people hovering over our military installations, our nuclear weapons, and have technology that um, outdistances our uh, military aircraft? Probably so. And, and so it opens up a whole conversation and a whole Weltanschauung, a whole perspective. Um, and, I, and I think that as we move forward uh, with all the stuff that's going on in the world, I think the end of this year, beginning next year, we're going to be uh, having conversations, I'm talking about collectively, about things that we weren't even allowed to believe just a few years ago. That is so true. That is so true. And you, what I like about your book, Michael, is that it it's almost like a handbook for uh, experiencers, especially first timers like myself. Um, and and you you go step by step through the emotions and. Um, the ups and downs of should I tell somebody, should I mention this, am I losing my mind, you know, is this real? Because it does go against everything that we've been taught. And I'm sure there are thousands of people out there that have had experience but push them away. Because who would they talk to? Yes. Yes. That's exactly true. And like with any new experience, whether it's an addiction or what have you, you need someone, you need a non-judgmental presence. Uh, I'm a minister, as you know, and, and uh, when I was doing my chaplaincy training, we were taught, 
and this phrase was always used. When you enter the patient's room, I was a hospital chaplain, your job, whether you're with the patient or the family, is to be a non-anxious presence. Because once you get anxious, it just goes around the room, whether it's the nurse, the doctor, the patient, the patient's family. And, you, you, you know, you want to take seriously, whether you believe it or not at the time, the, the narrative, what the person is saying. And the art of listening can be a lost art, but listening with your whole body, with all your senses, can be a form of healing. Yeah. And, and the book is written, it's, it's, yeah, it's, it's like 130 pages, but it's a lot of information. And it is a handbook, even the way it's built. It's a handbook. You can put yeah. it in your, in your bag or something and pull it out. And that's what I was, what I was looking for. Absolutely. It, it, it's my handbook. <laughs> it's yeah, it, so happy that I ran across, you know, because if I hadn't, I had been going through such emotions, and still, up until I read the book, I finally accepted. But before that, I was constantly trying to, to debunk what I had experienced. Yeah. Yeah, because it shatters your reality, and it's hard to wrap your mind around it. Uh, to this, today, uh, this evening, my, my, my first ex-wife got the book. I sent it to her and her new partner, and um, we've remained close friends over the years. And I remember, and, and these, these last couple of days we've been talking. We're, we're still very close, and we talk maybe a couple of times a week. And she went over that night with me of my first encounter. And she said, I remember it so vividly, how afraid you were and how I saw these shadows of, of gray, white-looking people in the room. And all of a sudden, I went into a deep sleep. I can't even describe it. And so I couldn't be there for you when they came, you were up when they came, and I don't know whether they put her to sleep or whatever, they probably did. And even all these many years later, since December 28, 1989, when I had my first uh, adult visitation, it, was, it, it, it still let me know I wasn't crazy. As a matter of fact, what I told her, I said, why don't you write that down for me, what you just told me tonight? Because I never know if I'm, when I'm going to need that. But, 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 but she, she said, yeah, she said, I remember it. There were these gray white shadows in the house. There was light in the house. And I said, well, that's interesting because we were asleep. There were no lights on. And she said, um, uh, and I just, all of a sudden, I just went into this deep slumber. And when I woke up, you were really shaken, which I was. And, um, so even these many years later, uh, just 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 that that affirmation that hey man, this really did happen to me. Not that I doubt it has been going on for so long, but just for to hear a loved one say, yeah, I remember that. Wow, it's it's I can't tell you how 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 it made me feel. It, it, and Michael, you do recount uh, both of your adult experiences in the early stages of your book. But, it, you know, since you were talking about right after the um, experience um, abduction ha happened, um, it, 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 you, know, you, you would write later on that um, yes, yeah, there can become issues between a uh, you know, husband and wife or you know, a couple um, at, 
after an event, and it, it can uh, put a strain on the, the relationship. Is that pretty uh, pretty common experience? Yes, it is. Uh, there there is data um, that shows that if one person is having these experiences and the other one is it, it you know, it, it puts a tremendous strain on the relationship because one person is 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 trying to be there for you uh, uh, and, 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 you know, in a healthy relationship, but they can't quite be there. And you're, you're trying to find out, the other partner is trying to find out, what's going on with me and and going through the the post traumatic stress that you're going through and so you're trying to find answers you're trying to maintain i mean listen relationships are hard they're difficult even without this <laughs> so now just add this to it just add this to it because they, and and then there's the stigma which is, which is, which is I, I think it's going to uh, be less of one as we move forward, especially with the government at being as transparent as they chose to be. That, but, but I mean, it's just that much. And if you have children, because there's, there's data that shows that uh, these visits come in families. Um, and so, so that, you know, you can just pile it on. And... You have to have a very, I was fortunate that I had two very understanding uh, partners, spouses, and um, that I can only imagine what my life would have been like uh, without that. I mean, I was really at some times just holding on by a thread. I wasn't sleeping. And I want to be clear before we go further. Um, I, I survived that, obviously, and I have, um, I have found that my experiences have been uh, in the long run. But at the beginning, I'm just saying that for listeners, that they were like, oh, my God, look at all this that went on. But, but at the beginning, it took me a while to, uh, to get a grip on what was happening to me. Ramona, do you have a follow-up? Well, I, I, it's just that I identify it completely um, because, you know, all my life, I mean, besides having um, paranormal experiences, um, I never had any personal contact uh, with any entity or being. And so when it did happen uh, last year, it was like, oh, my God. Oh, my God. I mean, I jumped out of bed, went into the living room, looked around, uh, got to the computer, started trying to find pictures of, you know, extraterrestrials to see what it was, who it was, where it came from, and... Uh, not being able to sleep, did I tell someone? And I was a nervous wreck. Um, am I losing my mind? But I'm too too strong-minded and too stable for that. I knew I wasn't, but then you start to doubt. And uh, you tell, you know, the closest person to you. But it's something that words cannot completely express what you're going through, what the emotion, uh, because your, the knowledge that you had is shaken to its core. And once you see something and know that you've seen it, it opens up a whole, a whole new path for you to go in search of what else is out there, what was this, and 
you know, it'll be a year in October. And I'm still shaken from it. Um, but I can talk about it without breaking down because it was very emotional. So I identify completely. And I'm sure there's listeners out there that have gone through this and have kept silent, which is, I think, what Michael brings out in the book, that you're not alone. And, and it helps to talk. You've got to talk to someone. So it's just, uh, wow. Okay. Yeah. Ramona brought up a good point about, you know, she's, after her experience, um, she was saying she, she was losing her mind. Uh, Michael, you talk about when it, it, the, you were having visitations on new and full moons, uh, you, know, you, you, you were having a lot of uh, fear at first. Uh, you know, you know. Okay, they're probably going to be coming back, and over time, you, uh, you know, wrote that uh, you, you, know, you, you eventually were looking forward to the visits. Um, but it, it, you know, it is an overwhelming experience, and you, know, you did uh, want to talk to someone, you know, like Ramona was encouraging people to do. Um, how, how did you know, Michael? You got involved in. Um, a group with Bud Hopkins and Gene Mundy. Uh, how did they help? Well, Bud and I became friends, but I, I didn't get in Bud's group. I was in a group. Well, well, first of all, Gene Mundy, the late Gene Mundy, helped. I found her book. I was, I was, I must have looked a wreck because someone told me I did. I went down to the Open Center, which used to be on Spring Street in Soho in Manhattan, and I bought every book I could find on UFOs and contact experiences. And I remember going up to pay for the books, and it was, it was, it was surreal. I felt like I was buying condoms for the first time. I wouldn't look the guy <laughs> in, 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 in the eye. I was, and he looked at me, and he said, you look terrible. And uh, I don't know, I think I may have said, well, thank you, or something like that. <laughs> and he was an interesting-looking guy because he was bald, but he had, he had dreadlocks, but they only came out of the side of his head. I remember that. He had no hair on the top and, like, maybe three or four dreadlocks on the side or, or around his head. And he said to me, that's a lot of books. And I said, yeah. And he said, um, you really don't look well. He said, do you? He said, is this a hobby or is this for real? And before I could answer, he wrote down a number on the back of a card that he gave me. He said, you need to call these folks. And I did. And I met a guy named Harold Eglin, who's still alive and posts on Facebook every now and then. And he was a lifesaver. And he had a support group called Space. S-B-A-C-E, I forget what every, each, each initial stood for now, but it was for contact experiences. And what had happened was I wasn't alone. It was like a support group. And as, as fate would have it, not all, but I would say 80% of the people there had said they had experiences, thought about them, that they were positive in the long run. And at that time, you know, I you know I was get kind of getting used to that, and, and I put used to it in quotes. But and 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 but our group this is before I got there. But when I got there, they would occasionally get together with Bud's group. And at that time, 
And Bud didn't soften a little bit. But at that time, Bud's group were people who were really trauma had traumatic experiences. They had sperm or an ovum taken. They had anal probes. I mean, it really wasn't a pretty picture. And so they probably thought we were crazy, but we did get together every now and then. And so, and I was kind of more in John Mack's camp. And um, they, again, they affirmed it. Bud and I, we were at a, a conference in Long Island. Now, Jean Mundy regressed me, and I still have some of her tapes. Um, and I found her name in the back of a book called Encounters by Dr. Edith Fiore. And uh, it was a wonderful book about people who were experiencers. And in the back, she had a list of mental health professionals. And so I kind of closed my eyes and looked at the people in New York, and I picked her. I just closed my eyes, and whatever the page did, I pointed, and it was her. And so there was that affirmation that, okay, I'm, I don't need some type of drug to, to help me with reality. This was really happening. And she was a great hypnotherapist. Then years later, Bud and I were at a concert, I mean a concert, um, a conference called uh, the Long Island UFO Conference. It was on Long Island, obviously. And afterwards, he said, I'd like to regress you. And I said, sure. And so I went down to his apartment, um, and uh, he, he regressed me. And so that affirmed. And he didn't try to say, Michael, they're not, you know, he, they were doing bad things, and how can you think all this is positive? He was very as neutral as he could be. I didn't feel any pressure, but I did go deep, and he was telling me uh, what, had, what he had come up with. So, again, having um, the affirmation, especially early on, now I'm pretty much, you know, I know this has happened, but early on it was a game changer. How so? Well, as I said before, it, 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 it affirmed that I, I was, this was happening. Right. That okay. this was actually happening. Um, the, I had a good friend who was an astrologer at the time, Donna Cunningham. I remember telling her about it. She has since, she has since crossed over. But, and I remember her saying, Michael, wow. She said, I want you to go down to uh, the East Village and go down to Alphabet City. And she said, when you get to Avenue D and 10th Street, there's um, a, uh, uh, some graffiti on a wall there. She said, look down there when you go down, next time you're downtown, and see if that rings a bell. And uh, sure enough, I went down there, and whoever the artist was, they had painted pictures of Gray's faces on the side of a fence. And that, again, helped me uh, uh, because I said those are the people that were in my room. Wow. So once again, I was being led, if you will, just to, you know, just to get information and say, okay, you know, calm down. It happened. Where is this going to go? Mm -hmm. And then, of course, I started noticing the physiological changes. I got by on a lot less sleep. Um, I had really so much more energy. Um, my skin, I mean, my nails and hair grew really, really quickly. Um, and I can't explain it. I guess in these terms, people would say, well, you were down you downloaded. But I just felt very intelligent. Like, 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 I just, like, my IQ went up. I don't, that's the best way I can explain it. But for me, the most valuable transformation that has carried me through is that on a spiritual level, um, I think they, ex, you know, they kind of expedited my spiritual growth. And uh, what did that look like? Well, it looked like me being able to be vulnerable more. It looked like me really losing this illusion of separation uh, that 
that I was connected to all that is. That wasn't just a platitude. And what I did to other people, I was doing. Now, I knew that on an intellectual level, but that's one thing. But to really know it in your heart. I, I shared my feelings. Um, it was easier for me to say I love you. It was also easier for me to say I'm wrong. Uh, it, was, it, was, it was almost like a personality change or, or just, just a, a deeper sense of myself. I started getting the healing. Uh, prior to this, I was, you know, I left my Baptist tradition, so I was already on this path. I don't want um, people to think, oh, they kind of waved a magic wand, and I became this different person. I was already on a different spiritual path, but um, I think them coming really expedited it. But I was already reading things. I was studying um, the occult sciences and metaphysics. I started attending a metaphysical church. I had this um, this urge to, to study energy healing, and I wound up being a Reiki practitioner and teaching that. And then um, the Reiki energy started changing. The more visits I had, I, uh, people would say, boy, this is a different kind of energy. And it would usually happen, you know, after, after I had visitations from them. And why not? It changes your whole energy. And so um, those were the things that kind of led me on this path. I was still very closeted, though. I wasn't telling people about my experiences. When I did start uh, uh, being a little more public, I was just presenting this as research. And by research, I meant about, you know, with the Bible and stuff, because that's where, you know, I'm not into propulsion systems and back engineering, and I'm not built that way. Um, I'm, I'm, I want to know how does this change you? Uh, how does this change your inner life? And so uh, a woman by the name of Barbara DeBolt, who had a little mom and pop publisher out in Arizona, I don't even know if she's still alive, she published my book, uh, Alien Scriptures, which was my master's thesis. And But she said to me, she said, Michael, you're going to have to tell people what happened to you. You just got to do it. You just got to, you know, put your big boy pants on and just tell them. Yes, they'll be ridiculed, but, and it, that stuck with me. And I did. Um, uh, Michael, you're, you're just talking about, uh, you know, he, you weren't real, uh, closeted, but you, you, know, you weren't really uh, talking to a lot of people about it. Exactly. Um, but it, what do you mean by initiation in the title of your book? Uh, because you do um, examine that once you become an initiate, there is a uh, you know, period of time where you are um, isolated. So I, I, I just want well, to kind of work on that since you just – Well, that is the isolation. Up. That is the isolation, that mm -hmm. you cannot talk to people about it. Well, you cannot talk to many people about it. And so they're like trials and disciplines that you have to go through. I think I use – uh, an example of being a minister or a priest, but you are kind of taken out of the world for a while because you're reevaluating reality. You're starting to peel the onion about who am I really? Am I really this hunk of flesh, this, 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 this body with intestines and brains and, you know, the veins, or am I something more? And, and most people don't go through that kind of self-analysis unless they are very, very evolved, or they are going through, I remember when I became a Mason, um, you know, it, it, their, initiation, their initiation things that you, you have to go through, and, and it, you're, so you're like in the world but not of it. I want to be clear, I'm not saying you're better than anybody else, but you're on a different path, and so um, that means you're separate. The things that used to uh, that maybe other people want to do, you probably don't want to do. 
Uh, most people at the time, when I was coming up, they wanted to party, and they wanted to drink. And I had my share of all of that. And, uh, and I still enjoy a, a, an adult beverage occasionally now. But at that time, it was like I was going, as a matter of fact, when I was having my experiences, I was a party guy. I was an actor in New York. I was drinking and drugging and sexing, and I was, you know, getting these shows, and it was an ego trip, and it was wonderful. I don't want to put down being an actor. And when I started having these experiences, no one came up to me and said, this is not what you're supposed to do, Michael Carter. But there were some events that, that said this is certainly not all you could have in this life. And because you always have a choice. Even not making a choice is a choice. And so it was like a 360. And I was studying more. Um, I, I'm an introvert anyway, at least according to Myers-Briggs. And so I don't mind being alone. And so I was studying more. Um, there was a select group of people I hung out with who I could be myself with, and most of them at the time were experiences. But other times I was alone. Luckily, my partner at the time uh, was a deeply spiritual person, and so, you know, there was a time I was in the world but not of it in the sense of, no, not that I was vibrating on such a high frequency that I'm not of the world, but that this was a path and I needed to be trained for it. I needed to study. I needed to go to seminary if I wanted to be a minister and a healer. I needed to take classes in Reiki or psychic development classes. I needed to put the work in. If this was the life I wanted to lead. So sacrifices were required. Okay, so you also note that um, it's a common occurrence after um, a traumatic experience of something uh, paranormal uh, you know, it's you know, very difficult to explain that 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 uh, such a person um, may have a sudden uh, change in careers uh, is that uh, a pretty good explanation for your switch from acting to uh, get, getting involved in um, going to um, the Union Seminary and wanting to become a minister? Well, I always knew I was, I was going to be a minister. I wanted to be a minister when I was a kid. I just didn't know. I, I, I would say a priest. I didn't know the difference between a minister and a priest. But, and then it got to be less general where, uh, and, and I'm living that now because I am an ordained clergy person, I have my own congregation, that kind of thing. But then it got to be a little more, um, there was a little more clarity because I realized I would always be doing something in, where I'm delivering a message in front of people. And it, it played out as an actor being on stage, um, but I wanted to serve. and. It's hard to serve when you're in a business uh, that has a 99% unemployment rate every day that you're alive. I mean, not many people make their living from the theater, but I did pretty well. I mean, I get a pension next year when I'm 65. I'm not going to get rich off of it, but, you know, I, 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 I'm proud of it. But, yeah, I wanted to serve, and that was one of the characteristics. Now, I'm not saying that everybody who says they want to serve humanity is an experiencer, but most experiencers who've ever said that, inwardly or outwardly, that's been one of the characteristics. And so for me, I was, I was bored, I was tired, my friends were more happier than I was when I got a show, and I was always thinking, okay, when this show's over, I've got to find another job. And so I just didn't want to live that way anymore. But I took those tools, and here I am now, right? Uh, I, I, on Sunday mornings, I speak in front of a crowd of people. 
right? When I, before COVID, when I was going to do conferences, I'd be out there on stage by myself in front of a crowd of people giving a message. And then I started doing ancient aliens and, um, you know, uh, UFOs, the hidden evidence. I mean, these are TV shows, okay? And so I'm using the expertise I learned in the theater and, 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 and it's serving me well. I know, I know what camera to look into, you know, when, I, when I'm on the set. I know if I have to hit a mark, okay, this is where, you, you know what I mean? So uh, it, it's, 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 to me it's evident, I think even Ray Charles could see it, that the, 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 the training I got in the theater and on television, most of the stuff I did on TV was, uh, uh, was like soap operas, that kind of thing. I'm still using that. I'm still using that now. It's just in a different way. When I was an actor, I was trying to create illusions. But now I'm trying to, to dispel illusions. Yeah. To Let's get to a truth. I, I want to ask a question. Does it change or have you found uh, being raised, I'm sure you were raised in a church growing yes. up, okay? And likewise, does it change your view on the institutionalized religious uh, narrative? Yeah, it does. It does. That's why I left my Baptist tradition. But I want to be clear that I'm not anti-religion. Uh, I know very, very good people from various faith traditions that are good people that are making a difference in this world. And they believe the narrative they were taught. And that works for them. And I, I respect it and I, I, I salute it. It did not work for me, but I'm also at a church where every Sunday you will, you will see a Christian sitting next to um, a pagan, sitting next to a Jewish person, sitting next to uh, a Wiccan. I mean, that's the beauty of it, because there's a truth that, 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 that surpasses all of the dogma. However... Um, I am probably not, I, I'm not a very religious person, and I know people are saying, well, how can you be a minister? But they're different ministers. I'm, I'm a minister in the Unitarian Universalist um, tradition, so it's very progressive, and I still have the training. I went to a seminary, all that. I, and the reason, Ramona, that I wanted to be clear with that is because sometimes there's an arrogance of people who maybe have had UFO experiences, NDEs, um, and, and, and there's like, they, they talk bad or they, they, um, they denigrate their religion of origin. And I remember the Dalai Lama one day saying, you know, if, if, if Christianity or if your old religion doesn't work for you anymore, then leave. But don't talk bad about it because right. it does work for other people. Um, so, yeah, it did change the narrative. I, I wound up seeing the Bible differently. I wound up seeing different Jesus, uh, the figure of Jesus very differently. Um, and I studied other world religions, which I always did, even before my experiences. But it, it may, in light of the UFO phenomenon, it, it can't help but uh, cast a different light on what you read in these books. And, and, but I've had, I've had people say to me, can I still be a Christian and believe in extraterrestrials? And I say, of course you can. Yeah. Of course you can. You know, but, but I, I, I've, I have a simple little formula that's not original. A wise rabbi said this 2,500 years ago, by their fruits you shall know them. And I interpret that to mean I know what you believe by how you live. 
You can yeah. go to church every Wednesday night for Bible study. You can be at the, at the mosque on Friday <laughs> or at the temple that you're Jewish on Friday. And you can be at church on Sunday and in the synagogue on Saturday. But I know people who do that, and they're very mean-spirited people, but they're doing all the things on the outside. So right. I know what you believe by how you treat me, how you treat sentient beings, how you treat the earth. Right, right. Because I, I, I think that um, that could be a part of, we were talking the other day, and um, why there seems to be a lack of people of color coming forth um, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. talking about their experiences. And you even kind of touch on the fact that, you know, like religious upbringing or certain um, things are tolerated and not tolerated in the churches. So that in itself, because I had one person tell me uh, that, oh, it wasn't a, a extraterrestrial, it was a demon, you know. Yeah, 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 yeah. I remember those. I remember those days. Yeah, and, and I think that keeps a lot of people back, especially if they are, you know, um, raised in a church and they have these experiences and they're, they have a lack of wanting to uh, talk about it or come forward with it because of the fact of the stigma attached that you know like it, yeah, it can't yeah yeah, and yeah so, it's not encouraged it's not encouraged right. inquiry is not encouraged and it further and it also further uh, uh, convolutes uh, their sanity by telling them that was a demon I'll give an example the other day I was re-watching Taken about two days ago with my partner she and I and at the very beginning, you know, Spielberg's taken, they talk about Betty and Barney Hill. And um, this guy works for military intelligence. He's, you know, getting information about who certain people are. And they say, well, should we investigate him? And the actor says, his character says, no, we don't want to uh, deal with the colors. It, it muddies the water. And... You know, and, and, and it weren't, there weren't, weren't many people of color. There were a few people of color in it in, in certain uh, scenes in the movie, certain episodes. But even right. now, tonight, you and I, 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 you know, it's very rare, and I can count on one finger, when I've been on a panel or on a show where there's another person of color and, and, and when we're talking about this topic. So even for me, what we're doing tonight with Barbara producing this and with Mark here, this is big stuff. And I, hopefully that will change. Yeah. Your question was, you know, and, and this is with white brothers and sisters too, don't get me wrong, but, uh, but, but in, in the African-American community, and it's interesting because, you know, you hear all these stories about Jesus healing and all that, but it's almost like, well, Jesus did it, but you can't do it. So I remember telling people I did Reiki, and they were like, well, what is that? They thought it was some demonic thing, or where is Jesus in that? Mm -hmm. And Jesus doesn't have to be in everything. And, and so even with the UFO, I remember, uh, and this was, you know, uh, when I first started coming out 20 years ago, religious people would not even acknowledge UFOs. Now more conservative brothers and sisters acknowledge it, but they say they're demons. And, of course, what we don't understand, we fear, because we don't yeah. know that. But, but, but I think that in, in, a, in the culture of the African-American culture, because the church being um, such an anchor, whether, you know, through slavery uh, up until the present day, that it's threatening. Uh, it gets people anxious, and then you have race on top of that, and it just brought me back to, you know, the, the line in the Spielberg movie Taken, 
We don't want to. We don't want to bring the colors into this. It muddies the waters too much. Now you can interpret that many ways uh, that this general would say that, but that's almost like the attitude. But I am seeing when I was in Nashville uh, at the conference there back in 2019, I am seeing more people of color coming to the con. Not not in over not in overwhelming numbers. It still is abysmal. But I'm, I'm starting to see. Um, I, I don't know the guy's name. He used to be a, uh, a, uh, an anchor on CNN. He's hosting a show on, uh, he was hosting a show on the paranormal. This is a man of color doing that, who used to be an anchor. I forget his name. Uh, I've, I've, I've had people offer me, but they haven't happened yet, uh, you know, or at least say, look, we, 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 we may want to do a show on UFOs. Uh, we'd like to, we, would you be interested, if we ever raise the money, would you be interested in hosting it? And I say, of course I would. So, 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 so things are changing slowly but surely on that front. We have a ways to go, but it, they're changing. Well, uh, um, Michael, you have... I've uh, been a guest with uh, Alexis Brooks uh, yes. once or twice. She, she's a leading podcaster, yes. and uh, she was one of the hostesses at this year's Contact in the Desert. Yeah, yeah, but, but I mean, but all I'm saying is this, because I, I mean, I don't want to beat a dead horse. All I'm saying is this, we're celebrating one. We want to come to the day when it's more than just Alexis Brooks. You know what I mean? We want to come to the day where we just can't, we don't have to just point out, oh, well, there's Michael Carter. Oh, there's Alexis Brooks. You know, we want to, we want to be able to say there are more people because the UFO community, for better or for worse, is still predominantly white heterosexual men. And there are just other narratives out there, and those voices need to be heard. And going forward, I, I believe that that will change. That's all I'm saying. Yes. Yeah. But what yeah. you've done tonight is is remarkable to me. Well, I, I think everyone has an a really interesting story, and you know, Bar Barbara has her UFO uh, sighting as well. I I don't have one. I am I'm, I'm just weird. <laughs> no, no. But, I, I hear what you're saying, but no. But yeah. You know. But Michael, do you, do you think that your numerous appearances on Ancient Aliens you, you really help to get uh, more you know, people of color talking about, you know, hey, I, I you know, do, do want to tell you about, you know, my yes. experience yes. or yes. Get, yes. getting calls at the church? Yes, unequivocally. Unequivocally, yes. I can't tell you how many times, um, you know, um, but, but, I mean, it's always in, in society. One of my favorite bar restaurants I go to, um, you know, these last few months, there's been, you know, a little more diversity in the staff, in the wait staff and the cooks. And, the, and I, you know, and, and it's just good to see because this is a multiracial democracy. Um, and how can you deal with the, the diversity that's, off world with reptilians and with Arcturians and with grays and with tall whites and with Nordics and with the praying man. How can you deal with that diversity when you can't even deal with the diversity here on planet Earth? It reminds me of the saying, uh, I forget what Gospels it's in, when Jesus is saying to um, his disciples, he says, if I, if I speak to you of earthly things and you can't understand, then how will you understand if I speak to you of heavenly things? Okay. And 
Well, Mona, as you deal with more and more people, talk with Reverend Ed, are, are you having the same type of seeing the, uh, making the same observations Michael is having with people um, wanting to confide in you? Yeah, I, I, I think I can truly say that it is about the same. I, I've noticed it too. And, and not only with that, but like I said, religion play, plays a, a big role in how far you step out of your box if you're raised in the church. You know, I was raised in the church Pentecostal. Uh, and so, you know, growing up, when you have these psychic experiences and there's nobody to talk to because there's not this understanding. It's like Michael says, they'll say, well, where is Jesus in that? And he may not be in that experience at that moment. But it doesn't, you know, they tend to put a, a pressure uh, expressions and, and the things that you're able to do by demonizing it. Oh, that's the devil. That's a demon, you know? And so you're quiet. Or you gravitate to the ones that are more open about these types of things, um, metaphysical things, which is uh, not common unless you're, like, uh, involved in the hoodoo uh, voodoo experience, uh, Santa Maria, those arts, the healing, uh, the herbalists, and things like that. But just mainstream, you're quiet. You're quiet, Mark. You know, until one person steps up and says something. And I think that is what made me come out and say, look, and I always started off with the saying, I know this is going to sound crazy, but I'm not. But the other night or one night this happened. And you're scared, you know. You're scared to say this because you don't want your credibility to be shattered. It's not easy. So, yeah. Well, uh, Ramona and Michael, both of you have personalities that invite someone to want to speak up. Um, you, know, you know, you do foster foster and encourage um, the c communication to develop uh, um, that would be related to being a podcaster or minister, just, just dealing with people. Um, do, do you think your experiences helped to shape those traits? I, I, I think to a degree, uh, and, 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 I'll, and Ramona, please jump in. I, for myself, I, I, I think it's a little more layered than that. Um, uh, what, I, what I have learned is that um, knowledge is knowing what to say. Wisdom is knowing when to say it. And I pick and choose my battles, but I also don't, and, and part of this is because it's integrated into my life now. 
But I don't feel a need, and maybe it's because I have a platform with the TV shows and radio shows and stuff, but I don't feel a need to have to um, change people to believe this. Right. I don't feel that need. Um, I know people who do, and that's fine. I think that you can uh, waste your life, not unless you're particularly called to that, because people change when they're ready to change. Now, in addition to that, I do have a plan. If you notice on ancient aliens, I'm not talking about this. I'm not telling people I've had experiences and, uh, you know, that's not what they want from me. Do you know what I mean? They hire me for my expertise and on a certain topic or what have you. And so, but, but I do have that. Now, it, it, I'm grateful for having that platform, but I don't go on there. I mean, they, they don't even really, they just recently found out that I was an experiencer, at least some of them. So I think that, and I'm older now, too, so I've mellowed, but I don't feel a need that I have to make people believe. What I do is I say, this is what happened to me. Yeah. If this is what happened to you, we can talk. Yeah. Or this is what I see in the Bible or in other holy books. If you agree with that, let's talk. If you don't agree with that, we can still talk, but I'm not going to argue with you over it. Right. <clears throat> I'm not going to, you know what I mean? You know, it's just life is too short for that, for me. Uh, now, there are some people who that's their life's work and, you know, bless you. But, but I, I don't have the energy to be forcing people or changing behavior or beliefs. All I can do is share with you what happened to me, and if it resonates with you, then maybe we can connect. And I think that's, that's really basically how um, the mode of communication opens up with someone stepping out of their comfort zone and sharing. And that, you know, like on my show, that's what I do because everybody has a voice. But there are a lot of voices that are silenced. And, um, and I try to encourage or provide an environment or provide that shoulder that I've had strangers come up to me in, in stores and things like that and just start talking to me about things. Um, and it, it, I think it's an energy because I think your energy shifts and change. And I think having experience, like you said, Michael, um, it changed you and it, and it probably changed your energy. And Oh, no question. And, and that attracts people that they they can sense that I think and and what people are looking for is a safe environment or a safe space to have a conversation that they've been holding on to whether it's a, you know a life experience a trauma whatever and you'd be surprised at how how people, well, for me, they open up and and they feel it's important, I think, uh, that they have a place, that they, they know where they can go to let that out or talk to someone. And, you know, there's something about you, Michael, as well as Mark, as well as Barbara that that energy is there where a person just feels, I think I can say this to this person. And yeah, 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 th that's it. That, that's it. 
and, you know, it's no judgment, and they can feel safe. Remember at the beginning we were talking about healing, and a good listener is a healer. Yeah. <laughs> but when you're really listening to someone, and, 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 and it's a lost art, but, but our lives are made up of stories. And, and, and for a long time, I could listen to your story, but I couldn't listen to mine for a long time. I'm not just talking about with yeah. star people. Right. And I had to learn that, that my story is just as significant. My relevance is just as significant. And I think when people hear that and see that, whether, whether you're a person of color and you're coming out for the first time and at a UFO conference and it can be overwhelming and you don't see a lot of people who look like you, or... Right. Whether you are, uh, you know, whether you just had an NDE or, and who do I talk to about this? And it's, it's, it's very important to have that visual. You know, I was reading again today about someone talking about the Nordics, about these are really human-looking extraterrestrials. They, they look just like us. And I'm like, well, they don't look like me. They're blonde, blue-eyed. <laughs> So, so, so I'm just saying, you know, yes, on a spiritual level, that doesn't matter. But, you know, but we live in the world. And so when, when you say they're human looking, do you, do you mean, am I included in that? Am I included in, 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 as a human being in that? Because there are, I've, I've met people who've seen uh, uh, occupants of your vote that look like folk of color. You know, they're not green colored or blue colored, but brown and black. But you don't hear about that, and that's no, something no. else. But but when you hear, when but when someone says they look human, do, what do you mean by that? What do you mean? They look human. You mean blonde, blue eyed, and that's the. Uh, aesthetic here in the West of what's beautiful. You know, no one says the grays. Look, they have arms and legs and eyes. They're anthropomorphic. So are, so are some reptilians without the tail. So are some octarians. But, but, but just notice that the blonde, blue-eyed folk, they look like us. And so, we, you know, words are powerful, and sometimes we have to rethink. Yeah, what am I really saying when I say that? Now, when, that, when, when, when you say that to me, what I envision, you know, when, when I hear somebody says, because the thing that visited me did not, I wouldn't say it looked human. Um, it may be humanoid. Yeah. 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 You know, human would be oh. hair, you know, skin, smooth. You know, hair, two legs, two arms, ten fingers, ten toes, a nose, a mouth, two ears. That, that to me, would look human. And it's the skin, the skin on it, uh, the shape of the face, the body proportions, I guess. That's what I would say if I if right. I were, you yeah. Know. But it's but it's it's the blonde blue eyed folk who look most human. And 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 so maybe if I didn't live in America or if I didn't live on this planet, I wouldn't be sensitive to it. But I have to be sensitive to it because my survival's at stake. So yeah. so you know, so those are the things that moving forward you know, I'm not saying we're all gonna live in a Star Trek universe. But that was some of the beauty, and I just started looking at Star Trek three, four years ago, and I haven't seen all of them. Some of them I don't want to see. But that's what drew me to Discovery and to Deep Space Nine, that there were, these are commanders on the ship that look just like me, yeah. and that there are other species on that ship too, and nobody bats an eye. They date each other. They have yeah. drinks with each other. Yeah. You know? Uh, uh, and that's the kind of world I want to be a part of. Exactly. Exactly. And, and it, I think 
I think if the government was more transparent, that people wouldn't have that stigma attached and more people would nonchalantly share their experiences. It wouldn't be that deep, dark stigma attached to it before you first open up. I think if the government would say, we do know this is really what happened in Roswell and that place up near the Canadian border before everything was covered up, to not gaslight people into, uh, but I guess it, it, it goes deep because, you know, you have the religious factions that, you know, still don't accept that God may have created uh, other universes and other species, that this is the main and only source. And so that conflict, and I think that could be also part of the reason why they're not that transparent. Just a thought, because I, I, I really wonder why, what, what is it that keeps them uh, not being honest, but especially with all the people that do have experiences and all the reports. Well, how can you, but how can you be honest, Ramon? And I'm going to push back a little. I'm not going to blame the government. I mean, we all have our deep-seated fears and prejudices. But what are you going to say? These beings can come here. Some of them you thought that technology is like 35th century technology. What are you going to say? These people would, uh, 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 these folks would say, you know, you don't need coal. Okay, you don't need, we have cures for certain things. You're taking money out of people's right. pockets here on Earth. That's why they're not going to tell you that. Right. I mean, to me, to me, it's pretty simple. You, you, our, our whole way of government, our whole way of being, you would destroy. And we got it good. So, so to me, it's, it's, it's pretty simple, um, at least that part of it is. I mean, you know how much money cancer research is? And somebody comes here and says, we got a cure for that. Oh, man. What do you mean you got a cure for that? You're taking money out of my pocket. We don't need that. If I went out here tomorrow and started healing people, I mean healing people, I'd have, some, I'd have a problem. Yeah, but... I mean, it is, that's all part of evolution, evolving. Well, no, you know? I, I'm, I'm hearing that, but no, you're saying you don't see why they're not transparent. I'm telling you why. Yeah. There's, yeah. there's too much to lose. That, no, that's all I'm saying. I know it's part of evolution, but I'm just saying that there's an old joke. You may have heard it. Jesus is on his way to Jerusalem, and he's stopping off here and there, and he's uh, healing people and uh, lepers and people with illness. And he's right outside the gates of Jerusalem. He sees this guy lying on the ground with crutches, and he goes over to him. And the guy says to Jesus, no, 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 don't touch me. I'm on Medicaid. Yeah. <laughs> okay? I got it good. I don't need that. Oh, God. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> That's sad, though. Really. <laughs> I don't need it. Yeah. Yeah, I don't want you coming here and telling me I don't need I don't need to use gasoline and coal and you know how to get your ship from here to there and uh uh no, 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 no. You can cure all this. No. That's money there. We can't have that. That's sad. That. that is funny. I want medicals. Please don't touch me, Mark. Don't heal me. <laughs> I'll call the police. Don't you touch me. I'll call that Roman really soldier. Sad, but well, then again, but like, too. 
but then again, too, I mean, it, it, it's like the, what you had spoke on earlier. I mean, if we can get along with the differences on this planet as it is, even though I don't think, I, I think it, it really boils down to money. Uh, then how can we get along with other beings? And maybe that is the trial and tribulations that we here on Earth um, should have been headed towards, and we're not now. And I think I think that is the catalyst that is is going to come into play because we can't continue to be at war with each other like this as a, a planet until we realize that we are one race or like a field of flowers. Then there's no, there's no uh, open interaction with anyone else because we we just can't accept differences yet. And maybe this is the training ground for our, our, uh, our welcoming into the interstellar universe. Got to learn to play nice. And we can get some of that intelligence and those breakthroughs, but we're just not ready yet. Ramona, yeah. speaking of the breakthroughs and not ready for things, you know, which implies that you know, th there is something going going on. Um, Michael, you do cover Mary Rodwell's uh, research into children. Yeah, I just uh, have a, a few pages on it. What? How are some of these? Recently born children um, bringing something different to humanity. Well, first of all, they don't have the baggage we have. Uh, I don't know, but maybe they're just old souls. Now, I'm speaking collectively. I'm not talking about mm -hmm. everyone. Um, some, some of them, pardon me, are coming in and remembering past lives. Uh, uh, some of them are coming in um, with just a wisdom and a knowledge and an insight far beyond their years. And probably we're going to need that. Uh, the, the best thing we can do for those children, I don't say probably, we're definitely going to, but what we need to do is to listen to them, to not write them off. But we also need to be leaving them a planet. And so far it doesn't look like we're doing that. But, but, you know, they've been called star kids, indigo kids, um, indigo children. You know, some of them are very well aware of who they are and where they come from. Mary did a wonderful job. Um, I couldn't quote her word for word. And as did Richard Boylan uh, with his book, Star Kids, The Emerging Cosmic Generation. But I just gave them credit for, you know, the, the indicators that they were talking about. Some of them are very psychic. They can see auras. Um, uh, they're very in touch with their intuition. And some of them will report visitations by star people. Some of them will talk about their seeing uh, relatives or people who have passed on. The child's parents may have had visits by star people. They're very concerned about the earth. 
They're very concerned about how we treat each other. And this is at a young age. And these children need to be uh, nurtured. And they need adults to support their unique perspectives. Because they're going to go to school, people are going to tease them, marginalize them. Where are they going to get the support? Where are they going to get the support once they leave the home? And if the parents don't do it, God help them. And they may just, just have small circles of like-minded people. If they're lucky. Yeah. Yeah, I've often thought about that, too, because when I was growing up, um, I often wished there was a a school or, or somewhere I could be taught about these gifts that I had and what they were and stuff like that. And it wasn't unusual. Um, it was more so of that, but like I, it goes back to being silenced again. So, you know, like I'm 66, 7 now. So 60 years ago, that was going on, you know? And I, I could see and I could envision, I could see... 50 years ahead of time, I was saying to someone the other day, uh, I wish I could talk to my therapist at the time. That was when I was 16. And I told them, I said, 50 years from now, I'm going to be really sad because the world is not going to be any different. It's going to be worse, and children are going to be suffering. And I just ran it down to it. I had that man in tears. And here it is. I just realized it is now that 50 years. And look what's going on. And I often wish that, you know, growing up, that I had, like, trainers or a school, you know, like the regular school and then go to another school where they, you know, teach us about our gifts, the knowledge that we have because it's not – it goes in different directions of what we're being taught, age appropriate, but healings and, and things like that to understand our nature. And I look at the children today. Um, they're more fortunate because they are the result of parents that were getting into that new age stuff and so a lot of the parents are more open-minded and aware but still there should be schools for these children there should be communities where they can grow and evolve but they're they're not. It's still, it's still like it was 60 years ago. So it does, it doesn't matter how gifted or whatever they are. There's, there's no training, unless. And I've often wondered, are they being trained while they're asleep? You know, Ramona, how, how do we bring out those special gifts and make them more go, go more uh, global? Well, I've seen um, certain academies, uh, one or two, that have have come up, and. Uh, and they're into teaching um, and and learning and, and taking away any kind of stigmatism and letting the children um, be. And this started like maybe, I'd say maybe 40, 40 years ago, I started seeing things evolving. 
towards that direction. Um, there's got to be community uh, coming up. You know, it's not all about the adults. You know, everything is so adult concentrated that we are forgetting about the children, and the children are more aware, more gifted, uh, and there's more of them because it's almost like with each birth I'm seeing, um, there's an evolution going on there. But then they get into regular school. And I think that needs to change. And I, I think um, that educators and, and people that are studying metaphysics, I, I think metaphysics should be taught in, in school, has a extra curriculum or something. But it would have to be accepted by... Um, a more, more majority of our society. I think in some cultures it already is. Like in India. But Western, no, not as much. And, and I think that should be a concentration uh, of the adults that are aware. So maybe if there's educators out there or, you know, somebody with a, some money that can afford to start uh, starting these schools. Schools because it's needed. The training is needed. Otherwise, they're going to go wild. We don't want that. No, you don't, but you've got to realize that there are children that are being raised by parents who are aware, and then there are children who are in homes of people that aren't aware, so they experiment and stuff on their own, like I did. And, you know, it's not always a good thing. So there needs to be an awareness. I've always thought that, you know. Yeah. Michael, uh, since R R Ramona was just talking about experimenting to make uh, uh, maybe find the, the right environment for these uh special children um, what role is the organization free um, presenting to the uh, UFO uh, community well, free doesn't exist anymore. Eastman's changed it. Okay. Uh, Ray. Um, but what, what and, and Ray has been, Ray Hernandez is a pioneer in, in this work in the sense that he's giving data um, and, and, and from, a, uh, a, you, from a diversity standpoint, he's talking to people from all spectrums and all walks of life. And what he's, he's very adamant that he is not a UFO organization. He's saying that metaphysics, the paranormal, UFOs, that it's all, uh, it's, it's all interrelated. And that we don't need to study, you know, it's not mandatory that we study with separate disciplines. And I happen to think he's right. A lot of yeah. UFO encounters... Um, one could put under the, uh, the rubric of metaphysics, uh, telepathy, telekinesis, past life stuff. Uh, he, he's saying that all of these disciplines can be lumped together. And um, it's radical because a lot of people don't agree with that, and Ray's got a very strong personality. But uh, I think he's on to something. Yep. Um, because... 
uh, initiation, instead of being the spiritual transformation of the experiencer, it could have been initiation for those people who've had near-death experiences. Right. Absolutely. Um, it could be initiation for people going through any type of spiritual um, journey. You guys, sometimes I think I should have called it the initiate instead of initiation. But um, in, in, in that vein, I think Ray Hernandez is right. What I like about Ray is that Oh, I like him. He's my brother. I, but what I do like, I mean, even the scholars, because uh, Ray's an academic, and he surrounded himself with academics. But a lot of these academics, according to Ray, are experiencers, or they've had NDEs, and so, or they've had some type of what we would label a paranormal experience. And so, I think that's refreshing. Because yeah. many times there were people who had not had the experience, but yet they had the most to say about it. And they were making a living off of it. And the people who did not, who did have the experience, and maybe they didn't have any alphabets after their name, they weren't taken seriously. Right. And I get that to a degree. Because sometimes people can be far out and, you know, everybody wants to belong to a group. I get it. But, um, you know, it, it, I, I, I'm benefiting from that. I'm a minister and I have some degrees. But I'm also an experiencer. I get that. You can't have everybody uh, who, who says they've had an experience weighing in. But I think that the tables need to turn and that, People who've had now, who, who judges that, who picks it, who knows? But, and we probably, maybe don't even need that. But I think experiencers who, who, who've worked to, to, um, to integrate these experiences into their daily lives, um, and I'm not saying, you know, if you're an experiencer and it was a terrible experience, then no, that, that, that's not for you then. But, uh, I think that going forward, we need to talk to folks to tell their stories, and there's plenty of information there. Uh, uh, people have been told or shown things that maybe people in power need to know about. Maybe they already know and just ignore it. But I think, uh, and if nothing comes from it that way, at least a healing can come by. At least you can know you're not alone. You can start a Skype group. You can call people. Maybe there are people in your area um, that you can get together with. That's the least that can happen. And I hope this book can be a catalyst for it. Well, and, I, I agree with you, Ramona. And, and, Michael, in your um, A New World, if you can take it, you, know, you give us a little uh, biography of um, Giordano, Bruno. Uh, he, he was... Yeah, he was murdered by by John Calvin, um, the, we, the Unitarians like to claim him. He talked about the possibility of life on other planets. He wrote a book, he wrote several books, and he wrote a book about um, that maybe there is no Trinity, that God is one, uh, that the Trinity was maybe a doctrinal kind of um, an idea, and that everyone did not have to believe that. Again, he talked about life on other planets, and he was way ahead of his time. But he had one fatal flaw. John Calvin had said that if he ever got his hands on him, he would burn him at the stake. And so um, I don't know why Bruno thought about this, but he went to Calvin 
to try to persuade him. Remember, we talked about picking your battles, and John Calvin burned him at the stake. And with his books along with him. There, it seemed like that mentality pervaded for a very long time since the, what, 1500s. And it, what you accomplished, you know, with, you know, just say, uh, ancient alien appearances, your initiation, um, you know, the work of other people. Um, th there is becoming more of a trend now towards openness. Well, I talk about it in the book a little bit. Um, we're, we're coming into the age of Aquarius as of December uh, of last year, the solstice. I mean, 2,000 years of Piscean age where avatars, saints, Jesus, among others, prophets, they're trying to tell you that, you know, you need some laws. You need some rules here. You know, uh, uh, we need some type of structure and balance. But it was all outside of you. Well, Jesus did talk about the kingdom within you. The Buddha talked about going within. But most of those um, messages were, were interpreted as God is up there in the sky. Uh, everything is other aided. Everything is outside of you. And then you do have Jesus and Buddha and a couple other people saying, but you've got to cultivate your inner life. But those, those days are gone. There's no Savior coming to save us. And so... If we want to change, we have to start going inside. And, and, and there's a, a, a passage in the, in the Bible where Jesus says, greater works than I do, you will do. But there's a lot of, not, you know, there's not only faith, but there's a lot of inner work you've got to do to do that. And so we are the ones we've been waiting for. If we want to change this planet, if we want to um, uh, deal with climate change, if we want to become part of whatever a galactic federation or what have you, we have to be the ones to change ourselves. And I agree, even though I am hopeful, but I agree with Ramona right now, in the words of James Baldwin, we're not willing to pay the price of the ticket. The planet is screaming out, I need help. We've got to change. Because the earth doesn't need us to survive. The earth will survive when we're gone. And we, we continue to fight these wars, to frack, to detonate nuclear weapons, um, to build on, to pollute the, the, the rivers and streams. And uh, it, we can go on and on and on and on and on. And so even though I am hopeful that this age, we still have a choice. It doesn't mean, oh, wow, it's the age of Aquarius. Let's all sing Kumbaya and hold hands. No, there's work to be done. But the potential is there, but only if we choose to take it. Okay. In some ways, we have to grow up. Yeah, and uh, you know, we have to grow up. As, as a species, <laughs> I remember there used to be talk, and I don't know if this is true. I don't think it is, but people used to say, oh, well, at the 11th hour, if we have a nuclear holocaust or something, then the Space Brothers are going to come with their ships, and they're going to come and save us. I don't know if I want to bet on that. Could happen, but it could not. So what do you do? You've got to, you've got to work on it yourself. You can't sit around and wait for someone else to come and clean up the mess that you've made. Yeah. Michael, you, you talk about what, what you said is similar to about the end of your 
initiation, we write, uh, many saints, prophets, and avatars have been sent to our planet to raise human spiritual consciousness down through the centuries. Um, Is that being your use of you know, ha- have been sent to our planet? Um, is there some kind of like dependence that we have? Like you know, we could do things ourselves, but it, the teachers are being sent to us to stop us from you know, basically cannibalizing ourselves? I don't think they're telling us. I don't think they're here to stop us because if they were here to stop us, then all of them had failed. I think they're here to tell us. What's the old adage? If you want to keep on getting what you're getting, keep on doing what you're doing. And I think they're trying to tell us well, I know they're trying to tell us. I mean, when a, when, a, when, a, when, a, when a ship hovers over a nuclear missile site and turns off the mechanism to launch the missiles, I don't think you have to go to Harvard to figure out what they're trying to tell us. I just don't believe you have to go to Harvard to figure that out. I don't think that if they were going to take over that... I mean, my God, they could have done that already. And again, we're talking about different species, so I can't lump them all. And, but but they're, it, it, they're, not, they're not turning them off and say, okay, we're not going to turn them off. Go home and do your home. They're, they're, they're saying there's a danger. You don't know what you're playing with. But we still have the free will. And as of uh, August 31st, 2021, we haven't decided we want to change. I think the ego gets in the way. People don't want to get out of their comfort zone. They realize that the planet is in trouble. They realize that there's a awakening but they're not really they're afraid of what they'll have to give up in order to save the planet to make life better people people like power and people like their their cushiony life and anything that differs from it, they're not ready to, it's a change. And people aren't that quick for change. And so they continue to do what they do. There's a lack of collectiveness. And I don't know if that's a human thing. Um. I have nothing else to compare it to. But I can look at the feral colony out here where they're all together. But for some reason, humans are unable or unwilling to do what is necessary for the good of the of all instead of the good of a few. That's the way I see it. It's kind of sad in a way. But it's human. Yeah, you know, Michael, we're kind of wrapping up. It um, is... You know, Dr. Mitchell talked about having workable relationships with ETs. 
um, it, do, you, do you think that you know, they're, 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 they're offering us something that's you know, different than you know, the cookbook episode of Twilight Zone? <laughs> Yeah, I, yeah, but again, I, I agree with Ramona. Listen, right now, and I'm not talking about everybody. I mean, there are eight, nine billion people on the planet. But it seems that our leaders, for the most part, are not willing to do this. Right. And so the question then becomes, what do you do in the meantime? Uh, I, I go out here tomorrow. And I'm going to interact with other human beings. I'm going to try to be the best person I can. Mm -hmm. That's all I'm called to do. Mm -hmm. That doesn't mean if an asteroid hit that I'm going to, well, Michael's a nice person, we're not going to let it hit him. It doesn't mean that if there's climate change, Michael, it doesn't mean that at all. It just means that my, my choice is to be part of the solution. Now, it could be for a quote-unquote losing cause. I'm putting that in quotes. But that's all I can do. Right. But that's good enough. And so are they offering us a new world if we can take it? Yeah. But right now, we don't seem to want to take it. And there's nothing you can do. We talked about that. People only change when they're willing to change. Exactly. And they're not willing. So little by little. What, so so what I do is I'm raising my daughter to be a, a lovely, uh, intelligent, loving, authentic young lady because that's her her mom and I. She's our legacy. I'm trying to practice and walk my talk. I've written a few books. I leave something behind, but that's good enough. Because I, I, you know, there's an old 12-step, you know, piece of wisdom. I have to stay in my lane. I can't force people to do what they're not ready to do. No. But then again, I don't have to. I just have to be accountable for my life and how I treat my brothers and sisters. I can't say, you know, well, wait a minute, Ramona. They're, they're, no, 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 Michael, we're not talking about Ramona. We're talking about you. What did you do? Well, what yeah. about Mark? Did you see that? No, no, we're not talking about Mark. Yeah. We'll, we'll get to Mark. We can talk to Mark. We don't need you to tell us about Mark. What did you do, Michael? And that's how I keep my peace of mind and my sanity, and I still get to enjoy my life at the same time. I know people who don't do that or can't do that and doesn't make them bad people, but they're always aggravated because other people are not behaving the way they think they should. There are 8 billion, 9 billion people on the planet, all at different stages of evolution. Some old souls, some transcendental souls, some young souls. Some, how, you think all of them are all going to be on the same page at the same time? That's a fantasy. But all you can do is be the best, or at least try, you can be. And when you don't do it, you pick yourself up and you do better next time. Okay. And, and speaking of next time, uh, I do, do want to leave um, a little bit of time for Ramona to plug her next show and... Michael, what you have coming up next? Um, so, Ramona, uh, you want to tell people how to tune into your show? Uh, sure. Uh, it's Ramona Speaks the Other Truth on the Global Enlightenment Radio Network. Uh, it streams on YouTube, and it's on Saturday evening from 6 to 8 Central Standard Time. 
and it's a wide range of subjects and topics. Um, I don't have any guests um, for this next weekend, but I have several lined up that are super interesting. Um, the grandkids, great-grandkids of Jesse James will be on. I have, um, let's see. You have uh, Catherine Children coming up. In September, speaking on uh, Shakespeare and who the man is and is not. And uh, just give a listen. You can find it on Facebook or you can go to uh, Global Enlightenment Radio Network. Dot com. And okay. we also have an app that you can download to your phone and get all the shows. Okay. So. And, and, Michael, how, how about everything? <laughs> how do people find out about your books and your website? Well, they can go to uh, Reverend Michael J. S. Carter dot com, uh, and that's my website. If you write something there, I will answer it. Or you can go to Michael J. S. Carter at gmail dot com. Uh, my books are on Amazon and uh, and on Barnes and Nobles and some select bookstores. Uh, I don't know. Yeah, I have another radio show tomorrow. As you know, Mark, you've been very instrumental in helping me uh, push this book, and. Um, the ancient alien episode. I don't know. I, I've. I don't want to bug them. I've asked them three times, and they seem not to be able to have a, a an air date as yet. But if you're a fan of ancient aliens, just keep watching, and it'll pop up. Um, I'm sure probably in in, in, in in this month or or next. And that's about it for me right now. Just trying to get this book out and um, get ready uh, for the fall. Yeah. You- You'll be on the uh, Three Beards podcast from 7 to 8 tomorrow night. Yes, indeed. Thank you. Thanks to you, and I, I thank you. Oh, oh and, and, and I thank both of you for being such thought-provoking guests. And I am pretty sure that we made a, a difference tonight. I feel that we did. I mean, this was big for me. And Ramona, it's a pleasure, always. I hope we stay in touch. Oh, Barbara well, DeLong, we, thank you for producing this. Yes. Yeah. And um, I guess I'll be up in about five hours. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah. yeah th- I got to get up you. to work. Okay. Yeah. Th- thank you, Ramona, for uh, co-hosting <laughs> with me. We'll have to do it again so on... Yeah, uh, so some other, another topic, or you know, bring Michael back and do do some get get into another one of his books. It, it, uh, this was a, a very meaningful show for me. So, um, you know, we're almost out of time. Um, I just want to thank uh, everyone for tuning in, and we got a whole bunch of. Terrific shows lined up. I'll be back uh, next Wednesday afternoon. Barbara has Ahmed Osman on Monday. Uh, that's going to be a captivating show. So uh, yeah, keep checking the you know, BarbaraDeLong.com website for who we have lined up. And I think that's a about it. Thank you again, everyone, and we'll see everyone next week.